Two crimes. Two crimes to kick off AEW Dynamite. So we shall just get right into it. And hello, my friends. Welcome to Ups and Downs for Dynamite. But yeah, the start of the show, Alex Marvez was outside the AEW hotel where the talent was staying, which was very convenient because I don't think we've ever done this before. And he was trying to chat to Will Ospreay, who then did leave the building, and he was in a rush to get to the arena. So I hope he did get fined because that counts as being late when he got to his vehicle. And can you believe it? Somebody had stabbed his tire. So there it is. Crime counter comes down and it goes up by one. As he was running behind though, he told Alex Marvez he was gonna take his car and he sort of stole it. But then when Alex got into the thing, he was like, well, do you have a US driver's license? And Osprey did not answer that and he just zoomed away. So I'm pretty sure that's against the law too. Bring it down, uno dos. We then come to the arena too and out came MJF. Now, of course he defeated William Osprey for that international title last week and everybody was surprised about this but he doesn't know why because will couldn't even beat that idiot swerve strickland and he called him shane here and even said that he will be coming for that world championship soon so write it down on paper he then acted like beating william was super easy barely an inconvenience where he was like but don't retire man because instead why don't you just take a long walk off a short pier? So once again, bring down the crime counter. As I always tell you, go out into the real world today and say that to someone and you let me know how they react. And you let me know how long it takes you to go to jail. MJF then totally went off the rails because he talked about Osprey's grandmother who very rarely did pass away recently and essentially said, maybe we could bury you next to her and then insinuated that she was fat. I just started staring off into the distance here. I was like, my gosh, this is too close to the truth. Maxwell then wanted to talk about the international championship because he thinks this thing is absolutely stupid because who cares about the international wrestling scene? And if you do, you are not a very patriotic person. He then actually called the belt garbage and literally threw it in the trash because that's right. He's got a brand new title designed, which he did unveil here. And it is now the American championship because I guess MJF is going to wear a blue mask and call himself Mr. America. He also did this because he he wants a title that symbolizes the best wrestler in the world and the best country in the world. So you can see what we're doing here. As we're about to find out, the rematch between MJF and Will Ospreay will be going down in the United Kingdom. So what's a good way to ensure you don't get cheered? This. Now surprise, surprise, all the fans started to chant USA, which they must have seen coming. But Maxwell did try and shut this up. He was like, I'm not talking about you idiots here in Maxwell. I am talking about the awesome people in Long Island, New York which of course is where he's from. I actually called it the place of dreams. I was like, well, this is fantastic. We're going to Disney World. And we even had red, white, and blue streamers and a giant American flag with MGS face on it after this. And I suppose if you are going to tread this board, this is the way to do it. It was totally over the top. So once again, it is probably just a short-term angle because of course, very well-timed. Well, Osprey then ran out. He kind of beat up MGF a little bit, accused him of slashing his tires when he was like, ha ha, I have talked to Tony Khan. I have talked to management and I have got my rematch and that's right it's going down in Wembley Stadium at All In. He then picked up the international title out of the bin so yeah now essentially we're gonna do title versus title but not really. He also said that nobody is eating MGS horse shit and thank goodness for that because I don't need that in my mouth because we all saw what happened last week you could barely catch your breath you were totally out of oxygen, which is why you had to cheat with the diamond ring. We then played everybody's entrance music because people love doing that. And look, fair play to MJF. When he did come back and he made it very clear he wanted to be the bad guy again, there was a lot of individuals, probably me included to a certain degree, going, well, how is he going to get people to jeer him? Because he was a pretty good baby face. Well, he's gone and done it. So this was a super fun segment. And again, it just starts setting up this pay-per-view, which is happening in around about one month. And I'm sure Will Ospreay will win. And then we'll take this American title and we'll move it to one side. But let's not keep it around because we have way too many championships as it is. But in terms of kicking things off, it is ganging up. But yeah, there really was a lot of crime. As it was Blood and Guts Night 2, it was time to do the coin flip to decide who was going to have advantage in that death fight. What an interesting sentence. Now, Alex Marvez did this and he busted into the Young Bucks in the Elite's locker room. And who was on the floor? It was Christopher Daniels. And at first I was like, if he's dead, well, you know the deal. I think he's going to be all right, though. And the Young Bucks were all like, listen, we're going to use our own coin to decide. Surprise, surprise. It meant the Elite got the advantage. Because as Matthew Jackson revealed to us, the coin was gimmicked. They just had their name on both sides. Now, Hangman Adam Page was not with them. But Matthew Nicholas was like, don't worry, he will be here but you could see it in their eyes. They were just a teeny bit worried. Before we did go to our main event, though, it was Chris Jericho versus Suzuki in an FTW match. 
I just had one of those moments where I was like, imagine you had told somebody this five years ago, we continue to live in crazy, crazy times. Now, I'm pretty sure this whole thing was sponsored by Chops, because I kid you not, the first, what, five, eight, ten minutes was just, you chop me, I chop you, you chop me, I chop you. At one point, Chris Jericho's chest was just bleeding with blood. It was a dumb thing to say what else it would be bleeding with, but honestly, they were laying these in like they were knives. Jericho tried to come back with a springboard at one point, but Suzuki just applied the armbar where they went outside and just whammed each other with chairs. And because we did get all these chops and we did get all these shots, at one point, Chris Jericho was like, oh my gosh, I think I broke my finger. I don't think he was kidding either. It was like at a wibbly wobbly angle. So they were really laying their ship in. Now eventually Chris was able to stop this by raking Suzuki in the eyes and hitting the code breaker, but he only got a one, two, ooh. Actually, no, that's not true at all. He got a one, ooh. So the shirt is totally wrong, pro wrestling tees. Cause yeah, Suzuki kicked right out. Jericho then swept the legs cause he loves the karate kid and he applied the rules of Jericho. But Suzuki was like, yeah, I don't care about this. And he basically got straight out of it because he is one hell of a murder grandpa. Just when it looked like he was going to have the upper hand too and going for the gotch path driver, Jericho just whammed him right in the dick and he hit the Judas effect for the one, two, three. I was a bit like, wait a minute, if this was a no DQ match, which it was, why don't wrestlers learn that as soon as the bell go ding, 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 you just smack the other man in the groin, then you can win in about three seconds. This was entertaining though and was sort of some jovial joy before the absolute madness of blood and guts. And we had some aftermath here too, because even though Suzuki was able to rise from the dead and hit Jericho with a pile driver, out came Big Bill, out came Brian Keith. And they were beating this guy up. So it's like, well, who the hell is going to save him? And just for nerds and geeks like you and me, it was flipping Shabar. So even though the wrestling mass was against him, he was still able to kind of clear house. But the point of this, at the end, the two Japanese legends were standing tall. So people always go, oh man, what about the casual fans? I mean, it's always good to include everyone. But at this moment, I was doing the dancer joy. The learning tree also made sure to scarper after this. So I suppose we could be doing some kind of crazy three-man match or three-man tag team match or a trios tag match. Don't know why I'm giving it so many names. The point is up. Renee Paquette was then trying to talk to Willow Nightingale because she is the brand new CMLL Women's Champion. So good for her when Stokely Hathaway walked in. Of course he did. Now this was just a massive distraction because Chris Statlin was here too and she absolutely wrecked Willow as Stokely told Willow, listen, next week we want a title eliminator match. This is exactly what we should do because Statlander should win that and then it sets up to Chris Statlander versus Willow Nightingale in Wembley Stadium at All In. And given that they do have some major history right now, you could even give that thing a stipulation. I really do like this feud though because I think it's been super duper good. And thankfully, Renee was then able to get an interview because she was talking to Brian Danielson. Now, he admitted to the fact that he's not 100% right now and his neck isn't really that great, but that's okay because doctors can fix it. But I'm not sure that's the best advice for young people. Jeff Jarrett then found him and admitted that he was devastated he wasn't able to win the Owen Hart Cup for obvious reasons. But if anybody was going to get the W in that, it is the American Dragon and in fact, he's damn happy for him. He also wanted Brian to know though, that Swerve Strickland is on the level right now and he knows what to do. So if Danielson is going into this half-hearted, which it kind of sounds like given that his full-time career is almost up, he is totally get murked. So if Brian Danielson is going to be all in at all in, he better get on his horse and go all in. Now, Brian basically nodded after all of this and was like, man, I have some thinking to do. But once again, it's just a massive round of applause to Jeff Jarrett, who much like all his Owen Hart Cup stuff, is just cutting the best and most emotional promos. After this, even I was like, man, I'm going to run through a wall for Jeff Jarrett. And he definitely wasn't talking to me. Now, I don't know where this baby first turn came from, but we should ride this wave. Double J, ain't he great? We're also starting to tease that maybe Brian is going to become our next world champion. And talking of title shots, the number one contender for the TBS title was then out because Britt Baker was having her first match in almost one year. I mean, that's pretty damn incredible. She was also taking on Hikaru Shida here. And as we know from the past, these do have great chemistry. They're basically science. And that was the story here too. It was like, well, you know me and I know you. Therefore, when you go for a move, haha, I'm going to see it coming. It meant that Shida did escape the locked jaw because she doesn't want having her teeth wrecked. But when she came back with a falcon arrow, Britt Baker was like, no. Then essentially they had a stalemate. No, that is not a loaf of bread. Sheena was able to use Barry Barricade to get back into this when she hit the running knee, when she actually teased of doing the same move that she did against Sky Blue last week, which very sadly broke Sky Blue's ankle. Now, all the best to her. I hope she can come back soon. But this Sheena, she was out of control. Baker had enough by that point, though, so she tried to break Sheena's neck with a neck breaker when she put on the D&D glove. And I was like, man, why does no one listen to me? I understand it's not a pose, but essentially you are pushing the D-pad. As we have learned in 2024, if you do do this, your opponent is going to recover. 
and they're gonna smack you one. So shockingly, Shida did do that and she took her health back and she was able to bust out a German suplex. I was like, well, you can't say I didn't tell you. Now, to be fair, she did go for the falcon arrow, but Baker was able to reverse that into the locked jaw. So I was like, well, you just never know. She wasn't able to get there, though, which is when Sheeda started to ponder, maybe I should use the kendo stick here. So maybe she is turning heel, but this too counted as a pause. And at that point, Britt was like, man, I'm done with this. She did apply the locked jaw, argh, put her fingers right in there, and she got the tap out win. And again, given she has been out for like almost 12 months, I thought she did pretty damn well. And Mercedes Monet music hit instantly, because of course that's what Britt Baker has been doing to her, and she skipped down to the ring. But actually what she was doing was casting distraction. Because it ties into the fact that it has long been rumoured that Camille, the former NWA star, has signed with AEW, and she has been kind of inconspicuous by her absence, but here, as Britt was looking at Monet, who appeared behind her, it was Camille, she hit that torture rack slam thingamajig, which did look quite good, when she stood beside Mercedes Monet. So there we go, we now have a brand new pairing. It's also get you super duper excited, because as far as I'm concerned, the only reason you would team these two up is if Britt Baker is about to get a friend. And do you know who too has been out for a long while is probably going to return? Maybe at All In? None other than Jamie Hayter. We wait and see. Still though, I thought this match was good, as was the angle. And there's just something about Mercedes and Britt Baker. They hit it out of the park every single week and they're not even doing that complicated. Everything they do do is pretty damn simple and I'm giving it a nap. The Patriarchy were then backstage celebrating because yeah, on collision, Christian Cage and his fake sons had become the trio's champions. Christian was all super happy as well, although he refused to show his face in the arena. And because his fake son, Nick Wayne, had done a good job, he let him speak and Nick was like, yeah, there is a Raw Rampage match on Rampage, and the winner of that does get a world title match at Grand Slam, so I am going to try and do it. And I was like, why not? But the really interesting part is that Nick got distracted halfway through this because Kip Sabian was just hanging out playing Nintendo, and if you have been keeping an eye, he's been doing this a lot recently. So Wayne went up to him and said, listen, I know you're in that Raw Rampage match too, so I'm going to throw you out, and also, by the way, nobody cares that your dad is dead. I was like, oh no, this is why parents can be so terrible. We should not be passing on that lesson. But I really do hope this goes somewhere, especially because, of course, again, what is around the corner is all in Wembley Stadium. And I just think it would be lovely jubbly if Kip Sabian did have a match there. So I'm going to stand here and I'm going to cross everything. That guy has put in the time and he deserves it. When Pac defeated Boulder. Why not? And this was interesting too, because Pat quite clearly did this to get a win. Because let's not forget, a few weeks ago, he was like, oh my gosh, I need my Wembley moment. And he made it very clear that as far as he was concerned, that was going to feature the international title. Well, that ain't happening now, unless I got confused. I mean, look at me, I am an idiot. Bronson and Jack James were out with Boulder though, so I was having a great old time. Although Boulder got wrecked here, Pat came off the top rope and just whammed him with this massive drop kick when he picked this huge mammoth off and dropped him with a brain buster and he got the one, two, three. I was like, boy, how do you? That was pretty impressive. There was nothing else after this though and I really felt like Pat needed to say something, although it does tie into something later, so we'll talk about it when we get there. But at the moment, I don't really understand what the direction for Pac is and honestly, after last year, he has to be featured at All In. So now I'm getting a little bit scared, but listen, I'm never gonna get mad at Pat getting a victory, so I am gonna get it up but it is definitely a wait and see situation. Team AEW were then shown backstage and Swerve Strickland was trying to G everybody up for the Blood and Guts match. When Darby Allen decided, this is the moment I want to cause a fuss. You ain't my leader, Swerve, and I don't even like you. And then Strickland got in his face. He was like, man, I'll bring you violence. And I was like, great, they're all falling out already. This was the same for the Acclaim too, because Max Castle was like, man, Darby, we think you're a weirdo. When thankfully Mark Briscoe ran in, he said, look, this is what they want, man. The elite are all about divide and conquer, and we have to stay together and be a team. I'm like, you damn right, Mark. They then stormed off, because of course the main event was around the corner. I just want to underline that Mark Briscoe may be the best person on this planet. When we got to the real version of Mariah May, I suppose. Ah. But she is the glamour now, and the presentation is very good, because even though she walked out as herself, she still had the bloody shoe that she had bludgeoned to death Tony Storm with. I'm like, man, when you say it like that, it's actually really, really creepy. Given that May was facing Caitlyn Alexis as well, you knew what was going to happen here. And hey, fair play to Alexis, she really tried, but eventually she was out because she got hit with the May Day. However, Mariah did not make the pin there because instead she hit the Sweet Chick music and she hit the Storm Zero to get the one, two, three. So C is still taking shots at Tony Storm. 
I don't know if she likes it very much. Now, right after this, Tony's music did start playing. <laughs> this place went crazy. And at first, it looked like it was a bit of a ruse, like it was Shawn Michaels in Montreal teasing Bret Hart. But actually, no. For like the third week in a row, a masked person or a hooded person appeared behind Mariah May. And when she did reveal herself, it was Tony Storm. And she got a massive scar on her head now. So she's essentially become Harry Potter. Now, these two absolutely went crazy and tried to whip each other's ass when the referees did separate them. Which is when Storm got a microphone and said, are you ready to die? Because <laughs> I most definitely am. So, pull it down. There's the crime counter. Don't make me explain the rules again. So I just think this is a great long-term angle and I can't wait to see their match at All In. Because you would imagine that Mariah May could become the world champion, but now that would also be very sad panda. I just think everything we've done recently too has given this program all of the edge. I'm not talking about Adam Copeland. It is definitely getting it up. There is a minor down here though, because I just think if AEW knew that Mariah May was going to win a squash match, which I have no problem with, why did we do the same thing with Pac when he could have actually had that time to talk to us and tell us what the flub was now going to happen at All In? And I get it too, we were just trying to fit everybody in here in quick matches because blood and guts. But Pac could have been in his dark room where he's like, man, I'm a bastard and I sell the seven C's. We all enjoy those. So yeah, that was just a small thing that I did point out. But was it a big deal? No. Nope. It barely mattered at all. I do know absolutely nothing though, but I do know that we did have our main event next, and it was Blood and Guts, and I'm just gonna tell you this. You shouldn't really listen to me explain this to you, and you absolutely should go and watch it. It was nuts. It also did a great job, because it basically set out matches that are probably gonna go down all in and all out, and we started with Jack Perry and Darby Allen, and yeah, they're gonna be fighting at Wembley. Now, Allen was instantly killed because his head was going into everything, including the steel. When the scapegoat grabbed him and launched him, into the crowd. I was just like, how is this man still walking? How does he survive? We then got a bunch of trash cans and people straight up choking each other on the ropes. It's strangulation. When we also got hot tours, people were spitting at each other. Nicholas Jackson then got the nod, so he ran down with a bunch of weapons. But the first thing he did was a springboard leg drop. And even though Darby tried to fight that off, now he had the numbers game against him. So everybody just whooped his ass. Mark Briscoe then thankfully was able to come in and help out. And my gosh, he did. Because not only did he take everyone out, but almost instantly he had a ladder. And he was using that too. And there is just something about this guy. It makes you feel warm and fuzzy in your tum-tum, even though he's doing insane things. Now, as soon as one of the Jackson brothers was knocked down, Matthew Jackson was allowed to get in there. And he was bringing a briefcase, much like his sibling has done. And they just used that as weapons too, because they were throwing it into people's heads. This is when Mark Briscoe got busted over. And oh my gosh, the bad guys went to town on the good guys because they were just throwing people together. They were giving them bombs of power. And I did hear that little voice in my head go, stop, stop, they're already dead. It was Anthony Bowens who was able to get in there and help this though. And this is a really good idea because it puts a spotlight on the guy. But do you know what he did? He revealed a pair of scissors and he stabbed him. Perry right in the skull. Now I've told you many, many a time, when it comes to the crime counter, you can't really say it's a crime when it's in the confines of a match because everyone's agreed to the rules, but it's also an exception. You can't take scissors and stab someone in the skull. Bring it down, crime counter goes up by one. So we shall never think about scissoring in the same way again. And during all of this, Darby Allen also had a thumbtack skateboard because why wouldn't he have when out came a carder and he <laughs> had a Rainmaker sign. So what did he do? He grabbed Briscoe and he gave him a tombstone onto the damn side. The weapons of violence then continue because Max Castor was here with a microphone. But he also introduced a barbed wire board. And once again, I stared off into the distance and I was like, man, I didn't think we were going to see a BWB. That went so badly for the acclaim because it was Anthony Bones that took the worst of this because he basically got squidged beneath it when Nick Jackson came off the top rope and essentially took this barbed wire and smushed it right into Anthony Bowens. So once again, I was like, well, that's it, he's done. I kind of definitely felt left out during all of this, though. So he went and got some thumbtacks. He put them in Max Caster's mouth when the Young Bucks booted him right in the face with super kicks. I don't understand how they do this one. Like, I'm sure they are gimmicked or something, but I don't get it. And this is when Hangman Adam Page was meant to arrive, and I thought this was so damn good because he was nowhere to be seen. And as we were reminded, the match can't officially start until every single person has entered the thing. So at this juncture, we basically were left going, well, this thing could go on forever. Bowens didn't seem to care, so he wrapped some barbed wire around his leg and started kicking people when Swerve Strickland finally came out. And man, this was just awesome. Because as soon as he got to the side of the cage, Hangman was here because he don't care about no blood and guts. He just wants to kill this guy. He absolutely tried to do that too, because after he had bludgeoned him, he got some handcuffs and he handcuffed him to the cage 
when he took out Prince Nana because screw you. He's also screaming that Swerve doesn't deserve to be the champion when Matt Jackson was like, for the love of everything, get in the ring. And when the cowboy refused, Matthew got on the mic, he's like, all right, well, if you don't do what I tell you, I will suspend your ass. And I was like, Matt, I think you're going to regret that. Now, he did listen and the door was eventually locked, but Paige instantly fell out with a card because they don't like each other. And given that later on, Hangman Adam Page went for the buckshot and he accidentally took out the Rainmaker, well, I think that's going to be our all-in match. Hangman himself is just one of the most interesting characters at all in wrestling too. <laughs> and just to add some extra craziness here, Jeff Jarrett and Billy Gunn then ran out to try and save Swerve Strickland when kind of right rightfully Brandon Cutler was like, what are you doing? You shouldn't get involved when Jeff took the guitar, he slammed it over Brandon's head when they cut a hole in the cage to allow Swerve to get in there. It's like, this thing is even more nuts. Strickland had championship powers. He was able to take out everyone until the last man standing was him and Hangman Adam Page. So you can see what we're doing here. As far as I'm concerned, it's a huge bravo. They went to war because there was more BWBs and Darby Allen was just flying all over the place. When we introduced the staple gun, just to remind you, oh yeah, that's what they did during the Texas death match. Now I think the Jacksons must have prepared for this because they then went, ta-da! And they had about 74 different staple guns as the entire elite kind of surrounded Swerve and they were essentially going to kill him with staples. No one has ever said that sentence either. And while they did do this, Strickland was basically having the best time when he got one of these and he got his instant revenge. This is when Paige accidentally took out Okada when Swerve and him just fought all the way up to the stage. When they fell off it through a table, and those two were dead. Now this essentially left Jack Perry all by himself and the good guys did handcuff him to the cage. And yes, this is where we shall talk about the fact that Mark Briscoe got a chair and my word, he just whammed this guy right in the head. Now it was absolutely devastating, but nobody has any details here. And given that AEW has done this before, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that this chair was gimmicked and everything was done to pull it off as safely as possible. I mean, the alternative is you have Tony Khan and friends go, oh, we don't care about concussions. And does that actually sound like something that Tony Khan would do? No, it does not. So again, until more info has come out there, everybody just come down and we'll wait and see. Before all of that too, Nick Jackson had thrown Anthony Bowens off the top of the cage, threw around about 59,722 tables, when Darby also climbed up there and he hit a coffin drop onto Jack Perry and crushed him through a table too. So I was going through the wrestling move book and I was like, yep, we've done them all. As soon as Jack was cuffed to the cage though, we just whammed him with kendo sticks and gave him that chair shot. And the whole time he was saying, do you quit? Do you quit? Now, fair play to that guy, because he said no, which is when Darby went and got gas fluid, whatever you want to call it, he got gas, right? He got fuel, he poured it all over Jack Perry and he lit a match and essentially was saying, if you do not quit, I will set you on fire. So put it down, the crime counter. Can you argue that one? No. Now, Matthew Jackson was watching all of this. He said, look, would you please just stop? I mean, sure, we'll give you a TNT Championship match against Jack Perry at London. But that wasn't enough for Alan because he wanted to hear Matthew Jackson say, I quit. And because he didn't want his friend to die, he agreed, meaning Team AEW won the match. The best part about this is if you do have a wrestling record book, you are going to have to write down Darby Allen was victorious after blackmailing his boss under the threat of murder. So it's just totally bonkers, as was this entire match. Look, it's not going to be for everyone. But in terms of delivering on what you were advertising, we well, have to say they did a pretty damn good job. I also just think the Swerve and Hangman stuff is absolutely captivating. And if we do not do that match all out, what the flub are we doing? It is a massive up from me, though, from a sheer effort standpoint, if nothing else. I mean, the length they went to to try and entertain us... I never think we should forget that. Which brought us to the end of AEW Blood and Guts. And yes, like all the other Blood and Guts, it just makes you squirm and go crazy in equal measure. But even though it went like 45 minutes, it was pretty much a treat. As was this entire show. Up. Now, of course, please do leave a comment below and let me know what you thought about last night's AEW Dynamite. Like the video, share the video, and subscribe. Click the video on the screen, which is ups and downs for Raw, for all of my wrestling opinions. But otherwise, my friends, you take care, and I'll see you on the next one.